Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Uh, gosh, today I'm excited. You know, I get excited a lot because I'm like a little kid with this stuff. But this is a doc that I've been following on Twitter and I'm thinking, how in the world is, is he not everywhere? This guy is unbelievable. I looked at his answers to questions online. I'm thinking, wow, this guy really, really, really knows his stuff. And then I realized, let me look into him. He, he's written a book. He actually reached, reached out to me. He's like, hey, I'm doing a podcast. Would you come on as a guest? I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been thinking about having you on. So we're, we're so excited. Tro and I, you know, you've been on our radar. Dr. Tony Hampton, I, I would go through all your qualifications, but we only have an hour. I mean, <laughs> You have a book out, right? Fix your diet, fix your diabetes. It's it's massive. I mean, these are huge things. And man, protecting your nest podcast coming out. We got to talk about that. You do the yeah. living healthy program, diabetes prevention program, all this stuff that is on my radar that I really want to do. So you're kind of ahead of me in a lot of ways. And I'm trying to catch up with you, man. I'm, I'm going to have to start training and sprinting and stuff to catch up. So doc, welcome. Board certified in obesity medicine. So you've seen this problem. Tell us your story. Tell us how you got started, how you got focused in this area and how long you've been doing it and all that. Cause uh, okay. you're, you're doing some massive stuff. Yeah. It's been, it's really a gift to uh, change your paradox. And I, uh, when you have a fan, when you get family members that get sick and as a physician, we're always trying to help our patients and you're doing the best you can and you follow uh, what I now know are uh, guidelines that are not always based on uh, solid science. It's more uh, tainted with politics. And I didn't understand any of that. And when I saw that, huh, these guidelines are not necessarily the best thing for my patients, I, I, I started to think outside the box. So the first thing I always tell people is you have to be skeptical and you have to be willing to not follow protocol and question everything. Even if you have the, uh, the, the person in front of you who you trust, you, you question everything. So, so when my uh, family member got ill with diabetes, I wanted to help them, but in a slightly different way because you know people are not interested in medicine. So that led to a lot of research. And at the time I had been an eight year vegetarian. I loved the way I felt as a vegetarian. I, I didn't see a problem with it. The only thing I can reflect on with that was that I, you know, you're just like a cow, you kind of have to always eat, you know, so I, I found myself always having to eat. And uh, so I thought that my uh, initial project that Fix Your Diet, Fix Your Diabetes was going to be about being a vegetarian. I was following the Dr. Ornish methodology and, and Esselstein and those guys, and I respect everybody. Uh, but I just found that when I did my research, I started looking at studies and I recognized, huh, it seems like this whole Atkins thing is beating some of these vegetarian. I think one study was the A to Z study uh, that they did. And I looked at that and I'm like, man, Atkins is doing pretty good here. And the, and the metabolic profile, the things that we measured were looking good. Then I saw the SHAI study, S-H-A-I. I saw that, I'm looking at that. I'm like, wait a minute, the Mediterranean diet is doing pretty good compared to low carb, but the it's killing the uh, vegetarian diet. So, so, I, so I had to be critical of myself and I, I had to do a, a, a shift. So I said, if I'm going to put a book out there, let's at least base it on uh, science instead of based on my experience. So as an experiment for my family member and for myself, I said, let's try this whole uh, low carb thing and see how that goes. And and, and I started that journey. And again, this only started because when you personalize your doctoring and you are trying to help somebody who doesn't want to take medicines, uh, you start your journey. So, so, and then I think before I get off, I, wanted, I just want to explain what the light bulb moment was. So the light bulb moment was probably, I don't know if it was Dr. Jason Fong, but it was one of those moments when, I, when it was like, what's diabetes? And I thought it was a high sugar, you know? And then I realized after my research, I said, no, that's a symptom. And so when I heard that the first time, it was like, oh, diabetes is a, the, the, the sugar is a symptom, but what's the disease? And then I learned, and then I kind of remembered insulin resistance. I started reading about insulin resistance. 
And then I said, okay, so I'm really not treating the disease. So if I treat the blood sugars, then that's not going to really fix the patient. And the thing that really blew my mind was when I saw those uh, ACCORD studies, advanced studies, the diabetes, uh, the VA study, and all of a sudden they still have heart attack or stroke. So you mean to tell me I'm going to control my blood sugars like a maniac and I'm going to get it to the 7.0 or 6.0 A1C and yet I'm still going to end up with a heart attack or stroke, which are the leading two causes of death. What a disappointment. So, I did, so, so what I ended up doing is I said, well, let's focus on low carb, which is going to get to the metabolic profile. It's going to get to the waist of comfort. It's going to get to the, the sugar and the blood pressure and the, and the triglycerides and, and the HDLs. And, and once I started that process of talking to my patients about that, it was an easier sell. So some of this is, I'm, you know, I'm an African-American. I have an African-American patient population predominantly, probably about 90%. Are they going to be vegetarians? And the reality is I tried that for eight years. And it's not that after those, I'm like, do you, you do what you need to do, but this population I'm serving, they are not going to do this vegetarian. I probably got like five or 10% to do it. And, um, and then I started doing this whole low carb thing with my patients and obviously for the family member. And what happened was they were able to control their blood sugars easily. I just had to, yes, this is the cultural piece. And I'm sure you've experienced this, uh, Dr. Brian. What happens is, okay, I like cornbread if I'm African American. I'm not trying to, you know, throw out stereotypes. If I have a Latin American, maybe they do tortillas more than maybe a typical family. So, so the question is, how do I make that kind of choice? How do I talk about not eating the cornbread with the greens or the black? So, so, but compared to doing a vegetarian diet, it was easy because I was like, eat all the ribs you want, no barbecue sauce. So I had to find out how to train my patients that, and I trained myself, if I manage their disease and continuously just give them medicine or surgery, are they really getting better? And what I found is that they just weren't getting better. People were still dying of heart attack, stroke, and it was so discouraging, renal failure. And I have so many examples of, and I know some of the colleagues we follow on Twitter, like Dr. Uh, Fang, not the, the, the P-H-U-N-G, Dr. Fang, <laughs> and he posts, you know, patient stories, right? And so what yeah. you find is there are so many people who were not healing that now are healing. And when I say we've taken, and I don't want to, I haven't done a study on my patients, but I wouldn't be it's in the hundreds of people who get off medicine. And in my vegetarian lifestyle, which is totally okay for those who want to do it. I just wasn't taking people. Either they wouldn't do it or they just weren't getting off medicine because they, they confused vegetarian with eating pasta. They was like, well, eating pasta is vegetarian. So I, I didn't understand the value of um, sugar and starch and the value of uh, cutting down on those things. And that metabolic profile uh, is the more important issue. It's really not about the LDLs and the cholesterols. It's about inflammation. And, and, then, and, then to, and then how do you, so I shifted from disease management to wellness and prevention. And even when you think about that podcast, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, but the, the NES is an acronym. And I say, well, if we follow the acronym, then you'll, you'll have a path to heal. And, and, and so what I did in my office is what I, cause you only, I have, I literally had 30 people on my schedule yesterday. So, and I tend, even though I'm a medical director, I tend to be in the, you know, I'm kind of like on the front line because I want to model what my doc should be doing. And so most of my docs are 20 and 40 minute appointments. So how do I, how do I talk about nutrition in 15 minutes? Now I do have one luxury, which is on pause. There's a company called Scribble that writes my notes in India. So my notes are written Amen. You walk in a room, that'll make you religious, right? You walk yeah, in a room. Yeah, amen, man. Could you imagine that? You walk in a room, you just talk, and the next day all your notes show up. It's a it's, it's, uh, shout out to my Scribble team. It's called IKS. Oh, my God. So anyway, so what happens is I can walk in a room, and I have a little – we use Epic as our medical record. And so I can put on my medical record – uh, little buttons and it, it could be like, okay, how to do keto, how to, you know, what are the healthy fats? And I just bam, bam, bam. By the time you look up, I'll have like 10 pages of instructions. 
And I go through those instructions super quick. I need you to know how to read labels. So here that is. I need you to know what the healthy fats is. I use Boca, B-O-C-A, butter, olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil. There's other oils like macadamia nut, but my patients are not you know, use macadamia nut oil, right? So because of the cost and things like that. So what you do is in that, in that short visit, I spend 40% of it on lifestyle. And then the other part is refills and referrals and uh, I'm having symptoms. And what happens is initially it's like, a, it's like moving this boulder. Nothing happens at first because uh, you're trying to get people to make change. But then, then as things starts moving, you will come to work because you focus on lifestyle and people are like jumping out of their seat trying to tell you you know they're saying why haven't you said anything about my weight because they're so happy that they lost 10 pounds and if, and then they said it wasn't that hard so you know so for me when i go to work now it's like a joy because they think i'm a god i am not a god I'm just Tony Hampton from the west side of Chicago. Tough neighborhood, by the way. <laughs> so, Man, you're, you're close to a god, brother, man. I'm telling you, you know, what you're doing, what you're saying just right now, I've, I've had goosebumps since you've been talking, right? Because the impact that you're having is unbelievable. And, and the problem is the insurance people, and they, they don't realize the amount of devastation you're preventing. The, the happiness that grandpa is going to be able to be with his grandchild, you know, and, and see them grow up and, and the impact, especially in the African-American community, because uh -huh. you hit so many, so much wisdom in such a short time that I, I'm yeah. just like enthralled because you're saying, look, I've got to reach my patient where they're at. What are they going to do? Not theoretically what sounds great in, in this study they did with everyone locked in a ward. What's going to happen when they're at, at the birthday party? What's going to happen when they're out in the community, when they're going through stress, when they're going through divorce, when, the, when, when they can't pay their bills and, and their tents? So what you're doing is so massive and so critically important that I think people just miss the boat and they go, well, yeah, diet, you could try it, but it's probably not going to work. So here, do this drug, right? That's what we fall back on. It's a paradigm shift. That's, that's even if you think about how we were trained, we were, uh, if we give a um, statin, we get credit for that, which is a ridiculous concept. If I make sure my patients have their eye doctor visit, that makes sense. So we get credit for certain things, but we get credit for putting people on medicine more than the other way around. I, I was listening to uh, someone recently, uh, I think I was just listening to a YouTube video, one of the people we respect. I, it may have been uh, with the uh, Dr. Westman, uh, with his group, uh, the ADAPT group. It may have been with those guys. I love all these guys. And, and it was a comment about, you know, billing. Uh, and they made a comment that made sense. They said, we have, to, we have to make sure that we document certain things. And they said, you can get credit for not putting people on medicine and get credit for taking them off, but you have to put it in the note. And so, so we should be getting credit for taking people off medicine. And, and I, that's what we try to do. But anyway, having said that, one of the things I wanted to comment, I, I actually pulled this up on my phone because when you brought up African-American, I just want to say this. Um, I, I, I work with, there's a president, and by the way, you'll be proud. So we have a, we have a, a large health system and Trinity Hospital and, and is on the South Side of Chicago. It's the one that's been impacted by COVID the most because it's in a certain community in South Suburban. Now what's cool is that our, and he'll be one of my guests too, his name is Richard Johnson. Now, Richard Johnson is uh, probably in his 40s. He's a president of those two hospitals. It's like, it's like an aberration. So I'm very proud of him. But he said, we were talking about what we should do in our community in terms of sending the messages about how we do this. And so let me, sh let me share what he shared with me. He said that African-Americans have accounted for six times the number of COVID-19 deaths compared to whites in Chicago. And he did, and then, and then he said, in the Chicago loop, so that's the downtown area, the disease rate for um, diabetes is 2%, right? Now, in the south side of Chicago where I work is at 26%. The rate of cardiovascular disease is 47% higher among African-Americans than whites. In, in, this, in that same community. In the loop, which is the downtown area, the rate of high blood pressure is 10%. In one of the communities on the south side called Bronzeville, it's at 59%. We went from 10 to 59%. Now we go into the north side, which is kind of the, uh, 
uh, area of the city that's a little bit more, uh, you know, economically sound. Edison Park is a community. The asthma hospitalization rate was 3%. In West Inglewood, which is a tougher neighborhood on the south side, 73%. I mean, we went from 3% to 73%. So, and this is the biggest uh, stat that kind of blew my mind. The life expectancy. So there's a nice town on the north side called Streeterville. The life expectancy is 90 years, right? In the same city now, in the same city in Inglewood, you have any idea what that life expectancy is, Dr. Brand? No, but you know, I, and, you know, it's going to be complicated, especially if they're. It depends how they're factoring it too, right? Because yeah. you're looking at gang violence and, and deaths from so, accidents yeah. and things like that. Yeah, that's a legit point. And and I think about like pollution and stuff, but because uh, mm -hmm. that's where the factories are. The the eight. So we went from 90 years of life in Streeterville. Now we're down to 60 in Inglewood. Wow. Now, I want you to, yeah. So imagine. Yeah. Your zip code, um, they, they say this is the largest gap in life expectancy among the 500 largest U.S. cities. 30 years of life, 30 years that you don't have with your family, 30 years that you don't have to tell your grandchild how to be a man or how to be a woman, 30 years to not be present for your family uh, because you have a zip, different zip code. So, so as a person of color, as was the case when Advocate Aurora Healthcare, where I work, when they uh, had a uh, Facebook uh, Live this morning, and I was the only person of color on the panel, I, it, I felt it was my responsibility to make a comment about the things that are going on with George Floyd and that, you know, un unfortunate tragic. So we all have a little bit of a responsibility at some level, rather than just talking to a family member about, you know, life and or getting in front of a camera or doing a podcast, we have a responsibility to help other people see the world through a different lens. And the only thing that I can bring is my perspective. And, and that's why even as you listen to us talk about low carb, I want you to listen to other people in the other spaces, hear what the Dr. You know, Essel Steins of the world are saying, and then you have to, and then look at the data. You need, you need to lean on us a little bit because maybe we, know how to read a study and know how to look at bias, but, but I'm just saying, always be a continuous learner who's willing to hear other people's perspectives because they're, you know, you're, you're in California, right, Doc? Yeah, so, San Diego, yes. So, so I'm, I'm serious, I'm not making this up. I promise you, I went to San Diego for a conference twice and I was like, I wanna live here. So I'm curious, I don't wanna get off message, but just from that perspective, this is the, like, you're, you have a perspective, and that's what I'm asking this question. So is San Diego what I think it is? Because I'm looking at this 70 degree weather. I'm looking at, you know, it's not raining a lot. What's up? Is it, is it really that cool? Well, I'll say it's super awesome, man, to get you to move here. I would love to have you come out here, man, and live, right? Well, I need to the but, choir now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's not. It, it, and again, like you're saying, it's all a matter of perspective, right? I could be in a town where there's no gang violence, there's no problems and everything. I can go one block over, you know, like when I was in L.A., I lived in a very safe area. One block over and you're going to get shot if you if you wow. step out, out of line. So it's it's not a, a you know, there, there are very rough areas. There's very nice areas and, and some places, you know, most of them I don't like to go to the really nice areas. They're really fancy. It's not my style, right? So, yeah, so yeah there's always going to be a perspective and it depends on where you are. I mean, you know, when you look at economics, it's, it's hard to live in San Diego. You know, there's places where the gas is cheaper, electricity is cheaper and all that. So, you know, I think it's you have to take it all in and say, okay, yeah. you know, sure. what's important? What's yeah, important to me, important. you know, do I want to live downtown where it's a little rougher or do I want to live out where I can go walk my dog and not be afraid of getting mugged that that's morning? Fair. Right? So, that's fair. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll test you. If I, when I decide to visit, we'll just uh, hang out and then we'll, I'll, I'll test it. So it's not something All right. I plan to yeah. be with uh, Advocate Aurora for a while, but, you know, you never know. <laughs> Things may change, so we'll see. Yeah, the weather's nice, man. We got weather, but we got to pay a lot of taxes and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I stole a Chicagoan who just joined me. Kristen oh, really? Mayer, she's oh, going to be wow. my partner here. So there she's a low farm doc, yes, obesity yes. medicine trained, yeah, all that yes. stuff. So I'm glad yeah. I got her before she heard about you. That's good news for me. Absolutely. Yeah? We're good. And, and so that's what's happened in the practice. I, I, I incorporate the uh, stuff I've learned online 
and I incorporate, I did do the whole obesity boards. I think uh, the last time I checked, they were a little bit over 3,000 uh, board certified obesity docs. Now, again, you don't have to, I, I wrote my book before I even did that. So you don't have to do that, but there's something about um, us training doctors to understand obesity. And what I like about the obesity board is that they, I mean, you, it's, you're hard pressed not to find a doc that's not doing low carb. Like that's just what they do. And you wouldn't, you know, so, and it's not that, I don't know why that's true. I mean, but besides the science, it just felt like, I don't want to demonize any organization, the Heart Association, Diabetes. All I'm saying is that it just feels less biased, but I'm not 100% on that. I just, it just feels like we're looking at data and we're not looking at who sponsored us. You know what I mean? So I think that yeah. that's important. But so now I've seen all this success with my patients and you feel like you just got to tell more people. And what we're doing locally is the thing that you kind of alluded to, the Diabetes Prevention Program, which has always been around. Now, what I do differently is I, when I look at their science, right, the program works. I think it's 31% don't become diabetics in five years with the metformin. And it's about 58% with the lifestyle. Isn't that crazy? Like twice as much success, right? But yet our doctors don't practice like they know that's that. They still just give you metformin. I just told you that the lifestyle works better, right? So that's part of the problem. So, so we have that type of program. We modeled the COPD program after that. But, but what I was trying to say is I changed it. I gave it a little bit of a low carb twist. They allow you to do that. Their program is not really low carb. They're still saying things like low fat. So I twisted the, that. Everything in the program is the same. We just twisted the dietary. We did the same with the COPD program. And by the way, uh, one of the stories I shared at the uh, Facebook Live earlier is how with video visits, uh, we were able to, to, I was able to talk to a patient who literally cried on the phone because the only interaction she was having was with me for my video visit and for her COPD class that we're doing virtually. So uh, we can take this moment and start to educate the masses without having to have a face-to-face. -face. People are very engaged to interact as long as they become comfortable with the technology. So we got the diabetes prevention program with Advocate Aurora at some of our sites, the COPD education program, which I kind of started with a couple of people, Dr. Richard Bone and Dixie Jarrett, who is my real partner in how I do some of my social media. And then we started a food pharmacy and we spelled the P with the F, right? So Chicago Food Depository, uh, we hooked up with them. And when you talk about those social determinants of health, we went into the grocery stores, one called Safeway, and we noticed there's no cauliflower in here. So we had to partner with them to get some cauliflower and, and just ensure them that we're going to have people that's going to buy that. And with the Chicago Food uh, Depository, when we do our food pharmacy at Trinity Hospital on the south side of Chicago, what we do is we, they have to be educated first. Like, so they have to go through this line and we give them, okay, this is how you make the mac and cheese with the cauliflower. This is how, you know, so we teach them how to use the food and we're not just using the standard canned stuff. We try to pick and choose what they give us. And that's another thing we're doing. So, so as a, and, and so what we're going to be doing moving forward is we're trying to redesign our weight man. We don't really have a weight management program for the system. So I'm going to be one of the few docs and most uh, half of which are board certified, you know, BC medicine. And we're going to develop a weight management program so that we can take these thinkings to a bigger audience. The key though, and it's a struggle on Twitter not to do this, I try not to demonize other ways of thinking. I just tell people, you do you, I'm gonna do what works for my patients. And I think all of us know that it's difficult to trust epidemiological studies. It's just difficult to get the data for any of these diets. But in the moment of crisis, when I do low carb or keto, people heal, their triglycerides plummet, their HDLs go up, they lose a ton of weight, they feel like a million bucks, they get off medicine, they don't have to take insulin anymore. So what the heck am I doing if I don't offer that to people? I mean, the number of people who are on insulin and they were told that you're gonna be, you have a chronic progressive disease. That's what diabetes is. And, I, and what I had to tell myself is, is it progressive or not? It's progressive if you don't change your diet. So my patients understand this is a dietary disease. This is not 
You're, now, are you more predisposed to it? Absolutely. But, but you have to activate your predisposition. Your genome is sitting there just trying to do its thing to protect you. But if you keep putting poison in your body, then your genome is going to activate my alcoholism gene. It's going to activate my diabetes gene. But if you don't do those things, then they won't get activated. So we have to, so we have, to have a shift and retrain our doctors. And by the way, going back to the need to continuously learn, guess who's in school again? Yours. Dr. Tony. Yeah. Absolutely. Nutrition. I, I'm doing the whole University of Western States. I always like to do shout outs. <laughs> so shout. And in fact, uh, unfortunately, uh, in fact, uh, I know this is the uh, audio, but I got paper in front of me. I got a final uh, next weekend. So my week is going to be a disaster. And I got to take my, my sons are at WashU in St. Louis, right? So one graduated. We got to go back and get their stuff. And it's the same weekend I got my final. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is record myself with talking points I need to know. And while I'm driving those five hours back and forth, I'm just gonna listen to, the key is I gotta get the recordings done. It's just a busy life. Uh, but, but I'm gonna tell you something, man, this is, um, it's, it's just really, uh, uh, when you think about those programs, people have a path now. They have a way to like heal. And, and they're just so happy to have a doc or a, a nurse practitioner who understands this. And I, I would question, I, I want everybody to have a questioning attitude. So if you're a nutrition professional, or if you're a pharmacist or a doc or APN, and you yourself struggle with weight, right? If you yourself struggle with weight, then the question is, um, maybe you're doing something wrong. I mean, you should be a model of health if you're trying to teach other people about how to be healthy. So, so, and that's the irony of this is that I've actually had to have conversations with other professionals who are in this space and they're coming to the doctor who learns this stuff on YouTube and, you know, places like that for advice. That's because this ideal of we have to eat a balanced diet is a little overrated. So I'm not suggesting... What I'm learning from University of uh, Western States is that the phytonutrients do add value. Uh, are they essential? Is it essential to eat a, a, a fruit or a, it's not really essential? Is there value? There probably is value, but the key is there's only two essential nutrients, as you know, essential amino acids, essential fatty acids. So we have to start there. And then we can say, are there things that I can add? Now, when I finish with you, I'm gonna make a smoothie. In my smoothie, I'll probably have some frozen berries, avocado. I think I today I have flaxseed milk. How do you like that? And I have uh, I have some kale, and I think I have a cucumber. And I'll probably have that as my first meal. And uh, you know, by the time I have it, it'll be like a little bit after one. And then I think tonight I'm gonna have some uh, baked chicken and some mac and cheese made of cauliflower. That's what I'm going to have. I could, you know, so, and, and I guess I should speak to that briefly. Um, what I tell my patients is very simple. So is it possible you can delay breakfast to 10, 11 or 12? My people who are retired, they tend to do 10. My people who are not retired tend to do 12. Give, let's do our, you know, whole intermittent Jason Fong thing. And we're going to eat between 12 and 8 or, you know, 10 and 6, depending on what you want to do. Now you're only dealing with two meals, right? And then, I, and then I show them, I say, can you boil eggs on Sunday like it's Easter, right? And then can you just put those in a concealed container, put it in your refrigerator? Now you can grab two or three eggs or bring that to work. You got a couple of, you can get you some berries if you want to have fruit. You can have some nuts and seeds. You can have some guacamole, avocado. I kind of keep that at home. And then I teach them if you're at a restaurant, I don't know if they have Chipotle's where you are. Yeah. Right. So yep. they got, so, so, and so. So can you get a bowl with a, you know, a salad bowl? And can you just avoid the rice and the corn? For the most part, and the tortillas, of course, for the most part, you can eat the rest. You know, we have a place called Bueno Beef. Uh, it's an Italian beef place. Uh, can you get a beef bowl instead of the beef sandwich? Can you get a side salad without the croutons? And, and so what I do is I say, tell me where you, which fast foods you go to. Tell me, and then I'll say, because I just know this stuff when you've been doing it for a while. And you say, okay, 
can you get an app called Carb Manager or get the Calorie King Carb and Fat Counter? Can we count carbs and can I, I'm a, you tell me where you eat, you tell me what you have for breakfast, we'll turn that into brunch. And I can tell you what's wrong with the, uh, the raisin brand because it's 38 carbs and the, and the banana and the orange juice. And I say, you didn't realize you started your day with 92 carbs for, the, for those three items. Yeah. But they didn't know because they didn't know the connection between highly refined grains and juices just being sugar. And, and then once you divide that by four and give them a sense of how much sugar is in their food, all of a sudden they're like a light bulb goes up. And then, they, and then you're saying it's okay to eat the bacon and the sausage, right, Doc? And they, they look at you perplexed because the cardiologist told them. Uh, but what I would say to my cardiology co colleagues, yeah, if your LDL goes up slightly on keto or low carb, does that not uh, bother you less when you realize that the metabolic profile all improved? So what's more important, the fact that your LDL went from, you know, 130 to 140, but your triglycerides went down, your HDL went up, your waist circumference went down, your blood pressure is normal, and uh, I'm not even on medicine for blood pressure because my, I'm not, you know, it's okay. I don't have to deal with the side effects, I don't have to deal with the cost. So the question, my colleagues, what's more important? And, I, and, I, and this thing that's amazing about this, and we're not that smart. We're just average guys who just happen to slide into medical school somehow, <laughs> right? So the question is, we're all, you know, intelligent people. They know that insulin resistance is diabetes. They know that metabolic profile is important, but they don't practice like it is. Does that make sense? Like they do not. Yeah, it's, it, it, def completely it, de it defies logic. When you talk to these guys, my cardiology friends, I'll say, okay, uh, you know, we start talking about insulin resistance, you know, diabetes, and I'm like, what's the biggest, why, why do all diabetics have to be on a stat drug? All of them, pretty much, right? And they don't, can't right. answer it. Why are they uniquely predisposed to heart disease? Well, right. they just are, but why? They don't answer the question saying, why is that? That's what it makes, why are we doing this? At some point you say, what are the outcomes? Because the outcomes showed that they were better. Why? Because they're, they're oxidizing their LDL, they got all kinds of, you know, uh, metabolic damage. And, and, you know, one of the things that you were talking about, with that increased risk of asthma, that's pretty impressive, you know, and that's an inflammatory disease also. And you think, well, maybe more smoking in that area, maybe, you know, other stuff, toxins and, you know, stuff out in the streets. But, you know, you look at it, it's like, how much of these things are related to obesity, diabetes? Because I've, I've had, you know, people lose a bunch of weight and their asthma gets a thousand times. But it may be that they were allergic to something they were eating that we took out of their diet that's a possibility also yeah. but we're seeing that and mental health and anxiety and stress and, and i would love to see what you're what you're what you're seeing along those lines also yeah well uh I'm, i can personalize it um we had a medical assistant who um was not that old who we lost to COVID, and the reason why we lost her in fact they have her uh you know we call it going away when i went to school and i went to uh xavier university in New Orleans, and uh, in the New Orleans, they celebrate, you know, life. You know, it's like a parade, right? When they yeah, people yeah. die, so we yeah. do. She's having a balloon release tonight at seven, and she was young, but she had asthma that was not well controlled. So, really, the the key is first of all, yes, I do see a disproportionate number of my patients who are uh, getting ill, and it's not because they're black. You know, it's because they have chronic conditions that are not well managed. So let's, let me tell you what I do. And it, it kind of speaks to this, uh, this uh, mnemonic that I'm going to be using. I, you know, you mentioned the podcast, Ness, right? So I'm gonna, let me just briefly explain. I think my first episode, I'll probably just explain it, but I'm going to go through it really quick. So obviously the N is for nutrition, right? So that's probably the most important, important thing, maybe. Um, so, and that includes intermittent fasting. The E is for exercise. So I get my patients moving like crazy. We have an S, we're gonna do two S's. And this is, and, and when I expanded upon this, I learned this from the uh, functional medicine folk. And that's why I think this is important to learn. But anyway, the S is for less stress and more sleep. When I start getting sleep, you have no idea. Like literally I was at the light on this road I traveled regularly a few years ago. And I would fall asleep at the light on a regular basis. I'm talking about five o'clock after work, six o'clock. Those days don't ever happen anymore. Um, so, so we have, and then the T is for how you think. In other words, if you, we call it a fear pandemic right now, right? It, that, it, I, I had, I watched Anderson Cooper two months ago and was having chest pain. 
because they were talking about the doctors dying. So the fear pandemic, so how you think, I listen to inspirational people every day. Uh, a guy named Eric Thomas, they call him the hip hop preacher, Les Brown, Anthony Robbins, I love Jim Rowan, those types of folk. So, and the other T is for trauma. If your life, if you, rather it's a car accident or some other trauma. So those are like, okay, these are the, that's the nest, but this is what I'm gonna do to add to that as I get the podcast going. There's a rope, you gotta climb the rope to get to the nest, right? So what does the rope represent? You got to protect the rope too. The R is for relationships. Now, if you were, if I didn't, if you were a toxic relationship to me, this would be the last time we'd be talking. <laughs> Brilliant, man. You know, Brilliant. Then, yeah, do it. Man. that R is for relationships. Yeah. You can't be healthy. If I'm in a bad relationship, I'm not going to have control of blood pressure. I'm not going to have control of diabetes. The O is for organisms. That's going to COVID right? And that's obvious, but it's also going to what I learned in obesity medicine when I trained for that. They talked about bacteroides and they talked about Firmicutes bacteria. So the, you know, and what you hear online and what people would joke about is that if you want to be firm and cute, you got to get rid of your Firmicutes bacteria. And the bacteroides bacteria is better for you in terms of weight. Now, Firmicutes liberates more energy from the food. So when you're sitting next to a person who's thin versus a person that's overweight, why is it that when they eat the same thing, one person gains weight and the other does? And that's because some of the bacteria is going to take more energy. And there's other metabolic things going on. But the point is, is it fair for me to demonize this overweight person who is doing what you've asked them to do, but their metabolic uh, situation or the bacteria is the wrong one? Now, one of these days, we're going to be giving probiotics to help people lose weight. But for right now, the key is to know that the organisms that you expose yourself to will either harm you or help you. The P is for pollution. And that's going back to the South side of Chicago. Yes, the incidence of asthma is higher on the South side of Chicago, but guess what? Look at all these factories. You don't see those factories on the North side of Chicago where you live into 90. So, so am I then gonna always look at that person with asthma who's a minority potentially and say they just don't care no it's because they live next to a factory can we can we do something about that and then the e is for two yeah. things one is your life experiences and your attitudes and beliefs so before i wrote my book fix your diet fix your diabetes my attitude was that you got to be a vegetarian to be healthy you got to be a vegan or something like that so I, you have to be willing to change your attitudes and belief based on what you learn. So some people listen to this podcast today, maybe hear something that they hadn't thought about, and it may change their attitudes and belief. But if you are rigid and not willing to change, then you will never live your full and healthiest life. So we got the experiences, and then you also have your emotions. That's the other E. So if I'm depressed, I'm not going to take my medicine. If I'm depressed, I may overeat or undereat. So... So we need to understand that our emotions affect our health. So, so, what, so in functional medicine, they have this functional medicine tree, and these are the roots, right? So what I did is I looked at the roots and said, how can I remember, at, you know, pass the test first? But beyond the test, how can I remember the parts of the root? I already have my nest. I've been doing that the whole time. But then I said, maybe I can use the rope to get to the nest to remember these concepts. But then also as we teach the place, so you'll probably see hashtag nest and hashtag rope to nest or something for me. Um, but, but, but the point is, how do we get people to remember that if I don't deal with the relationship, I will never be healthy. And that means counseling. That means I need to get rid of you. Beyonce said to the left, to the left. So if we got to get rid of somebody, that's okay. Because maybe then I can be that whole person I need to be. So, so it's really about looking at your patient and saying to yourself, what of those 10 or so things that they're struggling with? And if you're a clinician listening to this and you don't ask them those questions, then you really are not serving them. If all you're doing is being a guy that hands out prescriptions or a gal that hands out prescriptions, you're not really serving them well. And then you're not even going to feel like you're living your best life as a clinician because nobody's getting better. When you make this fundamental sh shift in how you practice, not only will everybody get healthier, but you will come to work and just feel like you're doing something that's making a difference. So... That's why I didn't mind doing a Facebook Live for our organization. And I thank God that they asked me to do it. That's why I don't mind spending time with you before I, I got to do video visits after this uh, interaction. You don't mind doing it because you feel like you're doing, you know, uh, God's work or the universe's work. 
And so that's what I'm trying to do. And that's why for me, it's not even, uh, it's kind of easy uh, to, to do this stuff because I finally feel like a healer. Finally. Man, you're preaching to the choir. I mean, just listening to you, I'm writing stuff down like, um, I, I want to get grab all your wisdom. And these are all things that I've been saying all along in, a, in not so uh, eloquent of a way. You know, I just kind of see it and go, look, get your emotions right. Get, you know, have some faith. Don't, don't be struggling. Don't look at all the bad people. Don't try to be offended. Don't try to, you know, live your life and always be angry and agitated. And people don't put enough weight into how important that is. There's no drug to fix those things, right? We can't, we can't fix the underlying yeah. pathology when you're, when you're, you know, fighting with your wife every day or you're beating your kids or whatever it is. Yeah. Those things are so critical. And this is a huge, it's not just what we're putting in our mouth. And, and those things affect what we're putting in our mouth also, because when you're stressed and upset and angry, because, you know, Dr. Tony, you know, when, when I was just yesterday on Twitter, this guy lost 180 pounds. You may have seen, he posted a picture of his before and after and he has some loose skin. Right. And yeah. this guy goes, what? that's disgusting. Why do you post that? You know, that's a personal thing. And this guy's inspired tons of people. And you say, how can you look at the same thing I'm looking at and just see the negative part of it and not say, man, that is awesome. And, and look at him. And he's dealing with that and he's yeah. bearing his soul for people. And you think, how can you be that kind of person? And I'm like you, it's like, I don't need that relationship. Get rid of that. I'm never yeah. going to deal with that person. I don't need that. Right. And, and so many people get upset and engage that person. And I, yeah, kind of like, you know, when you have a kid who's throwing a tantrum, you just walk by and don't yeah. engage there's, them. There's, there's, you know, as a, a person that's just in society, I'm probably going to just shrug, shrug my shoulder, shoulders and say, okay, that's, it is what it is. As a clinician, depending on the relationship, um, I, if you take a leader or a patient or a family member or a friend and they have these, you can call it borderline personality disorders, right? What I try to do is, you know, going back to the life experiences, that E in the rope, I understand that people are only a reflection of their life experiences. So I had a very difficult conversation. Remember I mentioned, uh, you know, we, you know, earlier I said, I, you know, I have a guy that I have to make sure I get his refills in before I start this uh, podcast. And I made sure I did that because he has a little edge to him. He does not know how to talk to our teams. We may even have to remove him from the practice. But the point is this. I, he, I talk to him quite easily for many reasons. Part of it is because I have family members who he's been in and out of jail. I just kind of know who he is because I grew up around that. So, and then I also know why he's angry, right? Not to justify it, but my brain says he's probably angry because he, had, he didn't have his dad around who could coach him. His mom, you know, used to be a little wild and in the street and he was embarrassed by it. And so what happens is I don't accept ignorant behavior, but what I do is if I'm forced to deal with them, I can at least tolerate them. So I have certain people, when I see them on a schedule, we don't let them sit in the lobby. We see them on the schedule. As soon as we see a ride, grab them, put them in a room because he they not right. And we know and but the thing for me is I have to. I can get, like if it's a friend or even a family member, I can kind of parse ways and, and minimize. I could be in the same like group of 50 people and just be in a corner talking to the group that doesn't involve that person. So it's, you can do that. As a clinician, what I try to do is say, somebody's got to take care of these people. So if there's a way to like take care of them without causing harm to my team and myself, then I'll do it. I do have a little bit of a reputation for having the problem patients, <laughs> but at the same time, God has given me some, you know, the universe, just the ability to deal with these people. And so when somebody, you know how it is on a Friday and it's like 4.30 and you don't want to ask them if they're depressed, right? Because you gotta, you know, definitely don't want to ask them if they have a chest pain. But uh, so what happens is I'm more comfortable with those because I feel like I have tools in my toolkit that will help guide people in a way that they can relate to. So if I'm dealing with the guy that's a little street, I have a little street history in terms of where I grew up. So I feel comfortable. And if I have the, the CEO who came in with all the articles and the, you know, I can, I feel comfortable dealing with them as well. So your life experiences help you deal with this. And I probably wasn't comfortable when I got on my train, but as the years have gone by, things have gotten easier. But, but the main thing is going back to I want to, I just want to piggyback around 
I, I, I teach them that lunch thing, what to kind of work on, and I show them how to count cards. But the dinner is easy. What's your animal and what's your two non-starch sides? I keep it really simple. What is it? Chicken, fish, turkey. What animal do you like? Give me about six of them. We're going to do this for two weeks and we're going to eat leftovers. And I need 12 sides. I give them a list of like 30 or 40 vegetables that are, that are not starchy. I need you to find 12 vegetables you like. You're going to eat leftovers and you're going to, you're going to cook three days worth on Sunday, two on Wednesday and Friday. And you're, and you're not even going to have to see Panera Bread or anybody anymore because you're going to be cooking and, it's not, and you're going to put most of the stuff in the oven or the slow cooker or whatever. So you have to, you have to kind of hold their hand, make it realistic, and make it tangible. And, uh, and what I found is that when I started doing that, things got better. So it's really, it's our whole health system has to shift in this direction. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping over the next couple of years that I can not only speak this world uh, virtually through social media, and things like that. And by the way, I'm going to have my website. It's the funniest thing. It's kind of not funny. It was drtonyhampton.com with a DR. And I kind of, I'm so busy being a leader and a doctor. I just kind of didn't mess with it. And then I let it expire. Somebody's now trying to sell it for more than it's, you know, worth. <laughs> so I just changed it to doctor, the whole doctor. And so it'll be drtonyhampton.com. So hopefully by, I'm looking at the date, hopefully by, you know, the, you know, June 20th of twenty. It'll be back active, and then we'll we'll use that to do the videos and the podcasts, and just to have a mechanism to teach people because people really need to get this information. And thankfully, people do get information through social media and through the internet and YouTube, and and then they can hear messages that are beyond the guidelines that we're being asked to follow. That again, yeah, are biased. And I'm so excited, you know, Ariel Ortiz, I, I don't know if you, you know him yet, you will. Uh, Christian Assad, they're, they're two Latino docs who are great, great people. Christian, and I definitely know him, I follow yeah. him. Yeah, Ariel hasn't been on Twitter. I'm, I'm, I'm dragging him over, but he's one of the nicest people on earth. He's a local San Diego guy, too. It just oh, happens cool. to be. And he's friends with Rob Zivis, who I met him through him, and I love the guy. Right, The first time I met him, I loved him. So, you know, you, when you see people like that, they're, they're going for a, a Spanish language to help people in Latin America and Guatemala, El Salvador, all these places where in, in the inner cities where people just don't understand. They say, okay, try this. Like what you're saying, say, look, if you like ribs, just don't put a ton of sugary barbecue sauce. Try it this way. Try it. Where you reach people where they're at, and that is the key. You can have guidelines, and you can tell people you have to eat this. Here's the pyramid. But if it doesn't apply and it doesn't work, they're not going to do it. If you tell them to go run a marathon, they hate running. It's not going to work. You know, you got to figure out where they're at and what they enjoy. And, and that's why you're such a great doctor. I knew that looking at Twitter, but talking to you, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'm, like, blown away. I feel like a total loser. I'm going to start going studying no. and working hard and doing all this. Stuff. But really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm joking to an extent, but really – the impact you're having and your podcast, I'm really excited about that. That's why I want our listeners to, to listen because just those little acronyms that you have and all that, it's, it's massive because people say, oh, yeah, that's like the roots of the tree. And when people get it, I love it. I do a simple thing with a train and people get it and they look at me and go, oh, so I eat carbs, I'm filling my train up and I can't empty it. And they get it right away and you think, okay, it didn't take me two hours to explain something. And that's why – I thought you'd be the first guest ever not to mention Jason Funk because he's impacted all of us. He was a huge impact yeah. in my life too. So all of us learn something. They say, wait, maybe we need to reassess what we're doing. And you had the wisdom to do that. And you're saying, okay, we can't just say they're in the inner city. We can't help them. You're saying, I'm going, I'm going in and I'm helping them. And you know, part of it, I'm wondering, what, did you take heat when you first started talking about it? Did people look at you and go, doc, what are you talking that's about? Like, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, one thing that's good about uh, some health systems, Advocate Aurora, and it used to be Advocate, but they changed it. We merged with uh, Aurora, which is in Wisconsin. So we're probably the largest population health organization in the country. And by the way, they, our motto is we help people live well. So I'm like, when I saw that, which is fairly new for us, I said, we have an opportunity. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, um, we, we, they allow us to be somewhat independent. Um, so we do have an opportunity to have a different approach. So if you walk into my space, with you'll see handouts that'll be different than my colleague that's sitting right across from me. So, so they don't really kind of coach you in that direction, although we want to do a little of that because we do need sometimes to have a little guidance. You know, I think in the ideal world, we'll, we'll do a, gen, a genetic test in the future and it'll tell you what to eat based on your genes. I don't know the tests that are out there now you know, good enough yet, but eventually that's what we're going to do. So, so yeah, I, 
I, it's almost the opposite. I remember one of the docs who's a, uh, a South Suburban Hospital advocate, uh, which is South. I was at a meeting and uh, out of the blue, he just got up and said, I just want to thank Dr. Hampton because I've been following him on LinkedIn and I've lost 60 pounds. And I've never, I didn't know, I, I didn't have a relationship with this guy. So what's happened is that there's sometimes tension, but rarely because we're independent. So I have been on, I remember being at an uh, event where we, it was a Go Red event and, and I spoke. It was so funny because they had a, I think she was a cardiologist. And of course, her presentation is different than mine, right? And the audience is like confused. But what was really cool about it is that I was able to, in some ways, explain why there's differences in perspective while being respectful to her. But I also had to still sell my case. And, and so ultimately, people are engaged. The, the docs are kind of paying attention, but not really. Like they, so when we have our healthy living program, which I did mention, so we had a, and we're gonna have to re, get that restarted. So we had a healthy living program where me and another doctor, her name is Dr. Katina Hope, who was trained uh, in, you know, had training in her training in obesity. And we would get in front of 200 people and talk about, you know, nutrition. And that's kind of when I had a chance to come up with the NEST acronym. And, and so, so when doctors see that their patients are getting better when they are going to this program, they are like, you, they're kind of so, there's a catch though. There's, you have to kind of, when you have stakeholders, you have to be careful. So I, what we would do is we would tell them, by the way, here are some of the things we teach to the stakeholders. That would be the doctors and the managers and other people involved in the patient's care. And, and, and when we would present that, they didn't push back. And I'm gonna tell you why I think they didn't push back. They, they're not trained in nutrition. So they may have this philosophy that says low fat, but they're not gonna push back too hard because they don't consider themselves expert in it anyway. So, so we never had a lot of pushback. And because of the successes that we've had, most people are like, they, they don't necessarily change their behavior, but they're like, huh, that seems to work. And what I started seeing is that patient, it was so weird to have another internist, I'm a family doctor, to, per, to refer their patient to me because I'm the diabetes guy. And I'm thinking, it shouldn't that be the endocrinologist? So when I started seeing that, right, or when the person was obese, and they would refer that person to me. So, so I knew that people had a mutual respect and maybe they felt like, well, I couldn't really figure it out. So let me let Dr. Hampton give it a shot. And, and, and most of what I do besides the basic information is I coach the patients. This is not about, you know what's funny about life? That like Dr. Jason Fong, when he talks, he, he makes it kind of simple. You know, he talks about the uh, two compartment syndromes and, you know, things like that with the uh, refrigerator and the freezer and all of that. And what happens is you just have to make things, you know, simple and easy. And I think with my patients, I just, I just kind of make it simple and say, listen, you know, you know, did, nobody asked them about their sleep. Yeah, doc, I only get uh, four to five hours of sleep. You know, I'm working, I'm a, first of all, a night shift worker, forget it, right? You're going to struggle. So the first thing is, is there a path to not be a night shift worker? And if, and, and if you can't change that variable, you know, let's see what we can do. So, and then I'll, and then I'll explain to them, University of Chicago, University of Wisconsin, and I think at Stanford, they all did the sleep studies and they show that five hours of sleep, you become borderline diabetic within a week or two, right? So, yeah. Yeah. so part of it is information. And the other part is, so what do we need to do to get you from five hours to six hours? And then I use that motivational interviewing. And what's cool about motivational interviewing is that you don't have to remember all the stuff that they teach you. You just have to understand the concept. So anybody can remember, okay, so you're at a five, how do I get you motivated to a level of an eight or seven? And then they'll tell you what they think that is and then you'll move on. Just having that moment of clarity, what is it gonna take you to, to do a video visit? And you're saying, I can only do it, I'm at a three. I said, how do I get you to a five? Well, I gotta get my niece. What's her number? Let's call her right now. You know, let's get your niece engaged. So what we do is, we, we find ways to coach our patients to a better life. It's just that our health system, like you mentioned earlier, doesn't compensate you 
And I got a little, I, let me tell you one of the things that we've been trying to do. We, we, how often do you get paid for a conversation with a patient before the pandemic? You know, not often. I mean, yeah. But so what we do is I see messages coming in. And when I see a message that's kind of in deep, a deep message, I said, call that patient and see if we can convert that to a video visit. So now all of a sudden the patient's made whole because they get a chance to interact with you at a high level and you're made whole because you're not spending that half hour on the phone with a patient and you're not being compensated for it. So, and that's a reasonable thing to do. None of us, uh, you know, are just servants and just here to just, we're here, we, we want to have a life, we want to have balance and all of those things. So we have to think as a whole unit, how am I whole? And how do I make sure my patient and, and my family and everybody else is whole? So it takes a little, so it's been, it's been like a journey for me. I feel like I'm just constantly learning and trying to figure out, you know, what can I do better? And the more I listen and learn from other people, the, and that's why I think I'm excited about podcasting because as I've listened, like this is, I didn't think I was gonna be doing all the talking, right? <laughs> so what's cool about podcasts <laughs> is that you, you learn. So I'm looking forward to having you come on the show and, and, and hear what your side of the equation was. I'm looking forward to having, you know, uh, you know, the, the Jimmy or Moore's of the world and, and Andy Fong's of the world, those folks coming on and just hearing their perspective because they're going to give me some nuggets that I can then incorporate into how I coach my patients. Just one or two nuggets can change their lives. Exactly. Just learning from you today is like, I feel like the student, like I feel with Jason Fung, like really you're, the reason I'm quiet more is first of all, people ask us to be more quiet. Tro and I get so excited, we can't stand it. And, and you're one of those guys, but I don't want to interrupt. Like when Rob Sivis starts talking, I just shut up and let him talk because he's unbelievably great. He doesn't need any guidance. He's just going to throw out all this stuff and you're like writing it down as quickly as they can talk. And you're one of those guys also, and you have a gift and you, you're, you have grace, you're kind, you want to reach people. This is how a doctor should be. Anyone listening, this is what a doctor should be. We should be real and we should say what works for you. Not that you have to say you could only eat broccoli the rest of your life to lose weight. It doesn't work. No one's going to do that. So you have to say, how do I bring it to you? What do I, like the church, like good church will say, come just as you are. And then we're going to try to work on you and make you a better person, try to help you and have better relationships. And all these things you're talking about is what's important because when the barrier is too high, people say, uh, too, forget it. If I can only eat steak the rest of my life, forget it. I'm not doing that because I like, I like to have some avocado sometimes. So, you know, so when people are very purist in their view, you, you, you lose yeah. the ability to help people. I, and I what you're doing is like, let me reach you where you're at and let me help you with yeah. life. You're a life coach and you're a dog. You're everything wrapped into one because you have a thirst for knowledge. That's right. I, you know? I think that, that that reminds me, and you know how uh, some folks say we got to keep peeling the layers of the onion, right? So let's peel Shrek. one more layer and think about that interaction with that clinical person, rather as an advanced practice nurse, uh, physician's assistant, or a doctor. Um, and the question is, why do they do what they do, right? So we talked a little bit about the fact that the guidelines are not um, uh, always independent and science-based, but the clinical profession in front of you is judged by that. So they may even be on a low-carb diet themselves, but they, they have to kind of push a certain narrative because that's how they're compensated. There's, we have contracts with insurers that say a certain number of percentage of your patients need to be on statins, right? Yes. I don't care about the aches and pains and the, uh, the potential cognitive decline and, and all these other, and 68% and you know, risk of uh, diabetes, things like that. The, the key is you need to have a certain percentage on statins, right? So, so part of it is the system has created a model that makes it difficult for a doctor who's attempting to think outside the box to think outside the box. So we're basically like a herd of doctors who have to, and if you deviate from the herd, and that's why you asked your earlier question about what is it like, then you're an outlier. So what I do is I document patient having side effect of the statin, patient, uh, you know, their metabolic profile is stable. There's less, they did a coronary artery calcium test. And by the way, everybody should get a coronary artery calcium test. 
Yeah, absolutely. If your arteries are not clogged at 60, they're probably going to be all right. So stop worrying about eating the, the fat on the beef if your arteries are not clogged. And if they are clogged, we, I think our approach would help. So you have guidelines that docs are stuck in that system. The policies, uh, you know, are, are, are affecting their decisions. And, um, and I just think that the system is creating an environment where it's difficult for docs to, to do what we're trying to do, which is we're comfortable being uncomfortable. And I don't believe, um, when you think about Tim uh, Noakes uh, in Africa, um, and what he had to go to when he was sued for just suggesting that a young person can eat a keto kind of diet, I think it was. Um, I'm not worried about being Tim Noakes. And to be honest with you, if I end up having to go through what he went through, then I would do it to save a life. I would, I would do it because I think that we need to yell from the rooftops. I'm tired of my friends, family, et cetera, my medical assistant leaving this planet early for lack of knowledge. It just, it just breaks my heart. I'm not gonna be married or a prisoner to a guideline when this basic knowledge that sugar and starch is harmful. Um, uh, that needs to be known to people and they need to know that those highly refined grains are not a requirement in your life. And you can get fiber from spinach as well you don't have to get it from a grain. They need to know that this idea that breakfast is the most important meal came from Mr. Kellogg and maybe a little bit from Mr. Quaker. Who knew? I mean, it, it was when I was studying for, uh, and I think that one I learned on my own for my book, how could that be that food companies have created the eating habits of the country? And I needed permission that it was okay to skip breakfast. I have not eaten today, and it's our, you know, Chicago time is about 1240 right now when this is being recorded. And um, I feel like a million bucks. And it's just the weirdest thing that ketones as a fuel source gives me the mental clarity so I, I could be on this podcast and sound like I got a little sense. I don't have a lot. <laughs> I can do that Facebook Live early and not be nervous because I got my CEO sitting right next to me. I can get on this video visits after this and I can have this smoothie, which I'm gonna have in a minute and not feel bad. After. You shouldn't feel, if you feel bad after you eat, you're probably not eating the right food. When I eat, I feel better. Yeah. And that's it. And we're just trying to tell people, take care of your nest, your rope, take care of the basics first. And if you're still sick after that, and 90% of you won't be, then we can start looking at these weird things. I, we were talking, let me tell you what's cool about learning. I'm learning about, um, I was listening to something about this week's lesson in, uh, for functional medicine is about mitochondria, right? And then I was learning all this stuff about the mitochondria and how important that is and, and, and the association with the mitochondria and multiple sclerosis. And, but in order to make your mitochondria healthy, it's, it's about, you know, there's certain supplements like the B vitamins that help and uh, a few other things, but for the most part, it was nutritional. So if you don't feed your body the right fuel, then your mitochondria, and obviously if mitochondria is your source of energy with the ATPs and all of that stuff, then clearly we need to do what we need to do to give it the right fuel. And so that they, we won't have mitochondrial dysfunction leading to all this disease. Now, again, if you had asked me about mitochondria anything a couple of years ago, uh, I would have been like, you know, I, I could talk about it, but, but you want to be a little bit more nuanced if you're out here trying to help people. So for me, what I do, because I'm not, like I said, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I learn and I teach. I cheat. You teach me something, and I'm going to go yell it to somebody either at a healthy living program, a diabetes prevention program, a COPD class, food pharmacy. I'm going to go yell it to the, to the crowd so that somebody in the crowd will get it. Now, the beautiful thing is this. I don't need everybody to get it because I'm not going to get everybody. But if you give me about 30 percent, 
I'm going to, I'm going to be happy. And then I'm going to go to the next crowd and get 30%. Then I'm going to go to the next crowd and get there. And then we're just going to keep growing this thing. Mm -hmm. And, but we're always going to respect the 70% who are not ready to hear it because they have other factors that can't allow them to act on this information. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and the importance is, is we plant the seeds and you know, what's happening. And my wife was just laughing to me, my, my friend who ended up getting diabetes, he, I was telling about low carb keto and said, Hey, you, and he didn't, he wasn't a voice. He wasn't a, I didn't have ears to hear at all, but then he got diagnosed with diabetes with massive sugars. And now he's my best friend and wants to know it all. So you have to have some grace and some, some, you know, say they may not be in the position. Then all of a sudden you get diagnosed with diabetes. Now it's like, you're all ears. Because it's fear, it's fear, and you get scared, and you go, "Oh my gosh, this is real now." When it affects someone else, no one cares. But when it affects you in your backyard, now in your home and your life, now yeah. it's scary, right? Yeah. Hearing those kind of diagnoses is one of the scariest things a person could have. But someone like you and me, really, they, we have tools to say, "Okay, you got this." But okay, well, this is manageable. We can we can take steps and do it. But it's going to take your work, and it's going to take my work, and we we could do this together. And I think that's where we have a powerful healthcare team. That's where we're going to make a difference in inroads, you know, and, and not giving yeah. up on people. Cause I give, I, there's, you know, doc, there's, there's a lot of people we've given up on and then all of a sudden, boom, they're, they're killing it now because they get it all right. of a sudden, maybe three years were frustrated. Then two years now we're happy again. Right. So right. yeah. So those, and those are like the, the prodigal son that comes home, you see them and they're like, they're, they're like, they know now that this is a good yeah, thing. Right. So yeah, it's all that. Man, I love what you're doing. Ev everyone, listen to his podcast. When, when's it coming out? Tell me about it because this is and you're and yeah, obviously sure. you know one of the things I want to have you back because I think you'd be a great guy to talk about with your your experience and, and you know dealing with a lot of docs. We have an epidemic of, of physician burnout where doctors are just done. They're frustrated and trust me, I was getting there before I started doing low carb and seeing my patients getting better. And I would love to just sit here for an hour and talk to you about that. So people have an understanding of what their doctor is actually going through rather than oh, yeah. criticizing them and, and oh, getting mad God. saying, hey, look, understand their life and what they're going through because they're not in their nest and the rope is cut. That's right, that's right. right. Yeah. I, I agree and that, that would be an easy topic. And the only thing I'll just say about that briefly is this video visit thing uh, is awesome because this week um, there was some uh, thing we we're, we're my clinic is right across the street from basically a little outdoor mall and so there was some you know incidents there and we're on the south side of Chicago so uh, Monday Tuesday and Wednesday I did video visits so what happens is as is the case now I'm about to do video visits I'm actually at home today and um so I can go in the kitchen and make my smoothie. Uh, I can put my food in the oven, you know, if it's like a, you know, if it's ribs, it may take a couple of hours, right? So, so my vision for the doctors and the APNs and the uh, physician's assistants is that at least one day a week, why not make Friday your video visit day or a Saturday morning? And guess what? Your quality of life is gonna go up just like that. So there's, there's and, and I mentioned earlier, I have uh, my note taking, my virtual note taking ser service in India called Scribble. So that, and I mean, not having to write, you know, thirty notes is, and to make yeah. them professional, so I don't look like um, I was half asleep when I wrote it. So we'll we'll definitely plan to have a conversation around that because if my patient understands me, and I can coach them in terms of how we're gonna interact. I, my, my two rules are this. I will have a relationship with you if two things are met. One is, does it add value to me, right? It could be a hundred bucks that you wanna borrow. If I think it adds value to me, I'm gonna give you a hundred bucks. The second question I have to answer is, does it harm me? If I got $200 in the bank, you're not getting a hundred bucks because that's gonna harm me, right? Yeah. So, so I do those types of things in my head and then if my patient hears that from me in a very respectful manner, then they know that I need you to only come to me with four issues or three issues today. We're not doing 10. We're not turning a 15 minute appointment into an hour. I am so comfortable saying that, but I had to grow into it because I was an enabler. I was the kind of person that just trying to keep everybody happy, whether it was at home, at work, the kids, the, the leadership. And I had to realize I'm going to say no. So if you came to me and said, let's talk about a topic I'm not interested in, I would have said, eh, I don't know if I really want to do that. And, but the old me would have never done that. So I think that's a great topic because people need to see the perspective 
of the clinician. And then maybe the world's a better place because yeah, that's, that's awesome. Let's do that, man. That's a, it's a date. Well, I want to do it. Cause I'm excited about that too. Once we get you a little bit of passion in life, then I think you're going to be all right, man. We just got to yeah. give you some personality and stuff. Yes. <laughs> I love no, that. I love it, man. I love your energy. And people are like, my wife looks at me like we start talking low carb and she's like, oh no, he's going to be talking for like an hour. He, <laughs> That's like right. my neighbors. Like, you want to talk about your hemorrhoids, it's not exciting to me. But if you want to talk about like low carb and getting your life together, I'm all ears. Let's talk. Right. It's just not work for me. It's just fun. Yeah. So the, I see it. I see the joy in your eyes and Tro is going to be so upset. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm enjoying this right now because the whole time I'm thinking, oh, Tro's going to love this, man. He's going to be so bummed that he's not here. But he will be here for the next one because yeah, make sure. physicians were not as a uh, it's 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 a major epidemic that we're we're facing. Yeah, and, and we're going to do our best to uh, support people through it. So uh, again, you keep doing the great work you're doing. I'll I'll, I'll do the same, and we'll kind of support each other and the rest of the. And then also, we're going to keep um, you know asking people with different perspectives. Share your perspective. We'll have a conversation and and let the chips in there. They're, and by the way, uh, that's what that the last thing I'll say is. When it comes to the uh, genome and uh, your genetics, uh, there are people out there who are not insulin uh, resistant. They're insulin sensitive, and they can probably do different things. So I'm o I'm open to allowing people to do what works for you. And so it's not one rule for everybody. But I do know that of the things I've done in my career, when I get people fasting and doing low carb, it just changes their life. So it's the the results don't lie. You can call it impaired data whatever. I just know that I've not seen uh, that many people change their lives. So I'm going to continue to push that message. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and how do the, the people listen to us track you down? How do they get your podcast? Because I'm going to be the first one to download. Well, it. it'll, I'll probably have it on uh, all the uh, usual suspects like, uh, you know, the Apple and the Spotify, but it'll be um, what I'm also going to do because I'm on social media. So if people just, you know, look up Dr. Tony Hampton on, uh, you know, Twitter and uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube as well. Um, and they'll, you'll find me there. And, uh, but the website is probably your best bet. So I would go to, you know, spell it out. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. T -O -D -O -R, you know, D-O-C-T-O-R, Dr. Tony Hampton, that's T-O-N-Y-H-A-M-P-T-O-N.com. So by mid uh, June, that'll be up. And then you'll have a link to the videos. They'll have a link to the social media and you'll have a link to the uh, podcast. And it's, it's really exciting. Uh, my kids are um, literally 20 and 22. So they're at an age where this is a good time for me to do this. They're fairly, all they need is money and uh, a little direction. They're good. So they don't, I don't have to uh, change diapers anymore. So yeah, we're in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all good. 19 and 21. Yeah. So yeah, that's perfect. Right. We're right yeah, there. Absolutely. Right. Now we can do some real work. That's but right. Man, thank you so much for joining me. This is awesome. I knew it. And, I, and it was a miracle that you reached out to me at the same time. I want to reach out to you. It's, that's it's, the universe it's, it's speaking. Tells the universe speaking right. it. So, so that we all, in our busy schedules, I know you have a lot going on, but just to join me and, and get this out, I'm, I'm really excited to get this to the people because you are a guy who's going to reach a lot of people. I mean, I knew that just from your Twitter stuff and keep up the good work, man. And, you know, you're doing some really good work in, in, in a hard population that to reach, but historically, but you're going to reach people and they're going to reach people. And they, what, what you're doing is you, you're changing lives and they're going to help their families. And, That's right. You know, That's and you see it spread from there. It's pretty That's remarkable. It works. Yeah. So okay. everyone, thank you for sticking with this. I'm telling you, this is one you're going to want to listen to at least three or four or five times because you're going to write stuff down and go, oh, I didn't get that the first time. Uh, so yeah, it's really important. There's so much wisdom that came out here from, from Dr. Hampton that's just crazy. So listen back, you know, absorb it. You know, take it to your friends, take it to your family. This is one that, that needs to get out to everyone. And his podcast, uh, listen to it, you know, protecting your nest, right? You're just That's right, it. protecting your nest. Right. I'm a, yeah, I'm going to keep it simple. And I'll, yeah. I, my uh, person who advised me said, don't do the rope with the, because she wanted to keep it simple, but I'm, I'll add the rope and the content of the discussion. Yeah, I can see the picture, man. So I'm really excited. So yeah. everyone, thanks for listening. And uh, this is going to help you. This is going to help a lot of people. So um, yeah, keep up the good work. Stay safe. Don't let the stress get to you. You know, enjoy life. Can't count your blessings every day.